Leadership Development Program for high school students in the District of Columbia, designed to build pride in their city and skills to effectively communicate their ideas and concerns through word and film. An initiative of the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C., Soul of the City provides participating youth opportunities to learn about the rich history, diverse cultures, and the common issues that bind the city's residents together. Students are encouraged to identify and consider the key issues concerning D.C. communities and devise resolutions for change. In March 2009, 40 students representing 15 D.C. high schools came together to strategize ways to unmask their soul by exploring four distinct D.C. neighborhoods. Armed with video cameras, pen and paper, and a thirst for knowledge, they set out to uncover the soul of the city. This is their story. Georgetown is one of the city's best known neighborhoods. Located in the Northwest Quadrant, Georgetown is home to high-end retail shops, fine dining, embassies, and Georgetown University. Today, Georgetown is one of the area's wealthiest communities, but that was not always the case. Soul of the City students visited some of the neighborhood's historic landmarks and uncovered a colorful past. So what was the church's role in the community during the 19th century? According to documentation, this church at one time had a very strong Sunday school component. Uh, and if you were to ask persons right now, you know, what uh, can they recall over the years going all the way back to the 19th century, that component uh, was, was very strong and strong in the sense that Many persons who came to this church who were not able to read, uh, they used that educational piece to teach persons how to, to read. Uh, if you look back in history also, you will see that at one time this church was very bright, vibrant. It was, um, in many cases, filled to capacity. Uh, this balcony was being used and so forth. Uh, it was not only um, uh, basically a totally African-American church, but the community a majority was also African-American, so you drew basically from the immediate community, wherein today uh, most of the members of this particular church come from uh, the Maryland suburb suburbs and uh, just a few from inner city. So we, we're doing a documentary on Georgetown and uh, Anacostia. What's your connection to Georgetown? My connection to Georgetown is both direct and indirect. My parents are, were born in Georgetown, um, and they grew up in the, 19, in the early 20th century, in the teens and 20s. Um, and um, though they moved from Georgetown in the 1950s, they had very lively recollections of having grown up here. Blacks, uh, African Americans came to Georgetown in the same ways and for the same reasons that they settled in other areas. Georgetown began its life as a tobacco port because of its placement right here at the edge of the Potomac River. Many of the tobacco planters who settled here and came to Georgetown to bring their tobacco crop in, to trade it and to ship it out, were slave owners. So with them came um, African American slaves. Come up to the corner. This is a federal period house. You have the white um, wood over the, the window. That's called a lintel. That's called a bullseye lintel. This is classic federal period. Anyone want to guess what this house goes for now? Yeah. If it were to go on to 1.5. How much? 1.5 million. No, more than that. Maybe like 3 million. Seven, seven, eight, seven, million. seven to 8 million, oh, I would guess. The largest um, 
exodus of the African-American community would have happened in the early 1950s. In 1950, um, the old Georgetown Act was passed, which legislated um, renovation or restoration of historic housing in Georgetown. Georgetown has some of the oldest housing in Washington, and it has a few, one or two, um, uh, remaining examples of the federal period. What the act in effect did, however, was force um, struggling homeowners, property owners, to have to move because they could not afford to make historic restorations of their property. And in cases of people who rented um, after the renovations and restorations were done, they could no longer afford to live in Georgetown. Right now, I think there might be, Vernon, eight black families in Georgetown? Yeah. About seven or eight. Wow. Seven or eight. One third of the population used to be black. Now, what a lot of people don't know, too, is that a lot of the white people were very working class. They were plumbers. They were traders. They couldn't afford to upgrade. And many of the white working class out as well. But almost all of the black community left Georgetown. Um, I heard you was a resident of Georgetown, and my first question is, what is your experience about Georgetown? What experience that you have in Georgetown? Well, I came here almost 40 years ago, and uh, I've seen lots of changes in Georgetown. It uh, was a very sleepy little village when I first came. Uh, there were a lot of uh, mom and pop stores, grocery stores, bookshops. Uh, specialty stores and uh, I'd seen it evolve into a really exciting, uh, vibrant, uh, full of action village where people are constantly changing and conversing and uh, it really has become a more sophisticated uh, little village than it was when I first uh, arrived. This is an interesting door. Do you see many houses who have a door that come out facing the corner like this? Anyone want to guess what this might have been one day? A store. a store. This is where you would have gone for your bread. You would have gone out to get your eggs. And there would be little stores on all the corners. Uh, many interesting people live here. Lots of politicians, uh, lots of artists, writers. Uh, there are many interesting shops on M Street, and there's a real feeling of community here. Uh, as an example, right across the street, there's a little store called Sheely's Market, and uh, it's up for sale. The property in which it's housed is up for sale, and the community has uh, gathered together. In fact, we had a meeting at this church only a few weeks ago to try to raise some money to buy the building and keep the store and Mount Zion United Methodist Church, where we're now uh, sitting for our interview, is thought to have been a site uh, for the Underground Railroad. They also have a cemetery, Mount Zion uh, Cemetery, which is on Q Street. Well, it's a fact that the uh, Mount Zion Cemetery, okay. uh, which is about two, three blocks away from here, uh, was indeed uh, used as part of the uh, Underground Railroad. Uh, and from time to time we do go up, we have uh, libation ceremonies and so forth to celebrate that. But if you visit the cemetery, you can see that you could proceed backwards out of the back of the cemetery and go down into Rock Creek Park. And if you follow Rock Creek Park through, um, you can end out um, in Tacoma Park, Silver Spring. So it makes sense from a geographical standpoint that as Georgetown is here right next to the um, waterfront, that someone may be able to get passage across the Potomac River mm -hmm. some kind of way um, and get out in Georgetown, find a place to um, hide out and get something to eat and some warmer clothing, and then with some assistance be helped out of uh, the district to go further north. Located on the Anacostia River, 
The Anacostia neighborhood is a historic community located in the city's southeast quadrant. This predominantly African-American community was once home to such notables as Frederick Douglass and Marvin Gaye, and its major thoroughfare bears the name of Martin Luther King Jr. While exploring the historic sites and considering the issues facing Anacostia today, students learned of the neighborhood's past as complex as its present. The Anacostia watershed is important to realize what a watershed is because that's the area that drains into a river and that has to do with the history of the river too. Before any of us were here, there were Native Americans here, they would canoe around and uh, trade down at the confluence of the Anacostia River, they had a town called Nakachtank. And Nakachtank in the Algonquin language means trading town. And then came Captain John Smith, which is a European explorer. And he came up the Chesapeake Bay, came up the Potomac River, and he got right there to that town in Nakachtank and he made a right hand turn. And he went up the Anacostia all the way up to here to Bladensburg, where we're sit sitting right here today. And back then he wrote in his journal that the water was crystal clear. You could see all the way to the bottom. It was 40 feet deep and there were fish jumping out all over the place. And in this part of the river, if I were to walk across it, I wouldn't even get my shirt wet. That's how shallow it is. And it used to be 40 feet deep. And the way that happened was, is there was all this farming that happened up here. They started growing tobacco in all this area around here. They cut down all the trees and trees have roots that hold all the dirt. And so every year, when they're tilling the soil, they're turning it over and they're turning it over, there's just this big pile of dirt. And when it rains on all that dirt, where do you think that water goes And that dirt? It goes into the river. So over a period of a couple hundred years, this river started filling in with a lot of dirt. By 1850, the Port of Bladensburg was no longer useful. In its heyday, like in the 1700s, the Port of Bladensburg was as big as Baltimore, as New York at the time because no ships were able to travel up here because of all the sediment in the water um, that was blocking the ships. They couldn't use this area as a port anymore. So people then, instead of using Bladensburg as a port, they started using Georgetown as a port. And that's been DC's main port, is Georgetown. The Anacostia Watershed Society is a nonprofit founded in 1989. And uh, its, its goal is really simple. It, it's to make the Anacostia fishable and swimmable at one point. How has pollution and neglect affected the Anacostia watershed? I think one of the worst ways that it affects it is, is probably like the visible stuff, the, the trash that you see on the side of the river. Whenever there's trash in a community or an environment, it kind of affects people's mentality and perception of that place. And so when people go to Anacostia Park and see nothing but trash on the banks of the Anacostia, they think, this river is a piece of junk. I don't want to be around it and then it perpetuates that negative situation and people kind of treat it like a landfill. Anacostia has another distinction besides the watershed. It was also one of the stops on the Underground Railroad. So with Georgetown, could you tell us about the roads of the Underground Railroad? Sure. It's, the Underground Railroad is a funny thing because everything we know about it is hypothetical because no one wrote down in their journal, I helped somebody escape last year, you know what I mean? So they didn't write that stuff down. So, um, but what we have found out is some evidence that suggests that different things happen. Um, a couple of years ago, we were doing some research and we found out in the, the far northeast corner of DC, a place called Deanwood, um, there are some basements that had been dug out where people used to hide. And in the middle of the night, they would, they would escape down Watts Branch. Watts was a plantation owner um, and there were lots of freedom seekers that were escaping from his plantation that would at nighttime sneak down to the Anacostia River. And it was a goal of people in Georgetown and all over DC and Anacostia and all around here to get to a place in Montgomery County called Sandy Spring. And that was a Quaker village that's at the very headwaters of the Anacostia. So people would find the Anacostia, they would come to here and they would travel. Sometimes they'd swim, sometimes they'd walk along the shore and they'd travel as far north following the river all the way to where it came out of the ground. And that was Sandy Spring. And that, the Quakers in that area would help outfit people to escape farther north. I hear that you lived in Anacostia. For how long did you live not in Anacostia? I lived in what was called Barry Farms for about 
10 years, Hartford Street, we always called it Garfield over there off of Alabama Avenue um, for 10 years. Then I moved to my home where we purchased on Fort Davis Place um, Southeast for 52 years. It was changing when I moved out. It was uh, becoming congested. A lot of homes were going up. Mostly our projects were going up all around. I think it's too busy. It's well, all the country is gone because you know we were really like living in the country and that's all gone. We lived just across the street from Fort DuPont Park, a lovely park and I took the children over there to play and I would be very comfortable sitting at a table with the lunch and let them run all over the park but now I don't think I would do that. Back then, is it what? Well, was it more um, diverse than you think it is now? It was mostly white in the neighborhood, and uh, it was wasn't easy living there because a few families that lived close to us they resented the blacks moving in because it wasn't everyone, but it was enough to make it significant to make you have a certain feeling. How long have you lived in Anacostia and describe how it was like growing up here? I was born and raised in Anacostia. It was a wonderful childhood. I, I enjoyed it. This, this house was probably here, but I used to walk these areas, these hills, and the Anacostia Museum over there uh, was not standing there, it was just a big hill. Well, we used to go up and down the hills to get to a Our Lady of Perpetual Help School on Marsh Road. For people to, um, visiting Anacostia, what would you want um, people to know and where would you like them to visit so they can get a true sense of the area? Um, I'd like for them to visit Fort Davis Place and Fairfax Village. I think there's some beautiful homes over there. Also, the Frederick Douglass home is a nice um, very impressive monument to go into, I think. And this um, Anacostia Library, I mean Anacostia Museum right down here, Smithsonian. That was nice that they put that in the southeast area. Very impressive. So what difference or changes have you seen over the past years? One of the main changes is so much automation. So we didn't really have, uh, my, my family never owned a car. My generation, we started to purchase cars, but my parents didn't have a car, so we rode public transportation. Um, a lot of countryside was in this area. A lot of landscaping, and with the buildings, and homes, and all, it's changed the look. Most of us know Capitol Hill for its astounding Capitol building and House and Senate offices. D.C. residents know the Hill as one of the city's oldest and largest residential communities, a home to longtime residents and a home away from home to numerous members of Congress and their staff. Capitol Hill is a diverse, energetic community that bridges the people and cultures of the North and Southeastern quadrants. 
Oh, Capitol Hill has such a rich history. Originally, when Washington, D.C. was formed, it was the federal enclave. And nobody really lived in D.C. except the slaves who attended to the congressmen and the senators who came to D.C. to do business. So the homes that are here now, built very well, strong, sturdy homes, were basically occupied by blacks most of the time. And so staying here in Capitol Hill means I'm part of the history and I'm ongoing part of the history. So it's just a rich culture that if you know it, you go, ooh. And right there is a church that's over 130 years old. And right there is a church that's over 200 years old. And blacks worship there. And so it's really a rich, rich culture for us. Could you tell us about your connection to Capitol Hill? Well, I was actually born here in Washington, D.C. and live on the same block my parents brought me home from the hospital, right across the street from my home. And so I am a Washington resident, Washingtonian, and have lived in this neighborhood all my life. When did your family come to Capitol Hill? They moved into the house back in the early 30s. And so um, I've lived there all my life. Any reason why your family moved to Capitol Hill specifically? Originally, my mom went to Howard University, met my dad there. And so when they got married, they stayed here in D.C. The first neighborhood where they bought a home was built originally for World War II veterans returning from uh, World the War. And so my parents were original homeowners in the property and never moved. How have you seen this, this neighborhood change? And It's been a roller coaster. I've seen it in its heyday, where everybody's lawns was manicured, flowers, beautiful. And we used to have neighborhood clubs where everybody would have competitions to see who had the prettiest flowers. While I still live on the same block I grew up on, I don't have very many neighbors that were there when I grew up. There are a few families that are still there and several generations have grown up and stayed. But I'm seeing them moving out of the city, moving away from the city. Even before Obama came into office, we started seeing some turnover. While it may not be the same residents back, we're starting to see homeowners taking good care of their property and starting to take pride in their property. So I see we're on our way back to a um, heyday again. If you could summarize. Capitol Hill in about 15 words or less, exactly what would you say? Everything you need in the world is right here. You get to meet all cultures. You are exposed to everything. I can go within blocks and go to theater. I can go another foot and go to a fabulous restaurant. I can go someplace else and meet people. I can be at the seat of the country's government within two minutes. And so where else can you do that but here at Capitol Hill? Located just east of downtown D.C., Chinatown greets visitors with the ornately adorned Friendship Archway, boasting colors of red, green, and gold. The elegant archway welcomes you to a small but bustling neighborhood of numerous Chinese and Asian restaurants and a taste of the East. If you go beyond just restaurants and you talk about kind of like the history of the area. This area, before it was settled by Chinese immigrants, it was settled by European immigrants, like German, Italian immigrants. Um, and it does have a long, rich history about immigration in D.C. What do you think really attracted other Germans that moved to D.C.? Like why did they move to D.C.? Because it was the capital of the United States and it was um, the seat of the government. The numbers of Germans that we're talking about in Washington is very small. At the um, sort of height of immigration uh, from Germany and other places, the German community was only 3,500 people. They owned stores, they owned boarding houses, inns, hotels, shops, businesses, and so really their everyday lives evolved around these neighborhoods and if you would have gone down there on an average day, German would have been one of the languages spoken on the street. What were some of the influences on Chinatown and Capitol Hill? of the Germans who live there? 
It was mostly architecturally and um, community life. Um, Adolf Kloss was one of the person who lived there for a while and um, who was the architect of a lot of the buildings that were constructed in the neighborhood. He built um, housing for families. Um, he built a number of schools all over the district and he built a number of um, government buildings and several market halls. One is, was the Central Market, which is where um, the um, National Archives building is. And the other one um, that is still there is Eastern Market, of course, on Capitol Hill. So he really put a stamp on, uh, Washington um, on Washington architecture. Do you know if there's still a large population of Germans left in D.C. in um, Capitol here in Chinatown? And if not, where did they go and why? There still is. Uh, German community in D.C. A lot of the Germans who live in the district these days um, have come over the course of the 20th century. But um, there are, of course, families that go back um, to the 19th centuries, um, to, the, uh, to the 19th century, um, whose family um, emigrated from Germany, settled here, and they've lived here ever since. They don't really live downtown anymore, though. Um, they're still um, Germans that live on Capitol Hill, but most of the Germans um, who lived here at the time when Klus was here lived on 7th Street, which today is the heart of Penn Quarter and Chinatown, but um, all that is gone. What about you? Like, what, what is it about DC that makes you want to be here? I think it's a very interesting uh, city because it combines two things. It, there is, which I consider the real DC of the people who were born here, who lived here, um, whose families have been here for a long time. And then there is the city um, of the federal government and all the international organizations. And it's fascinating to see these two sides of the city. But for um, a uh, foreigner like myself who comes here to spend a few years of their professional life, it's definitely a great place to be. Do you know why so many Chinese came to Chinatown? Um, I think it's because of the community. The more, pop, more Chinese people, the more they feel more at home. This Chinatown, I think, was established in like the 30s or 40s or something like that, and before that we were in a different location. A lot of the leaders in Chinatown have been in, been in the area since, you know, the 1950s, and they always had a vision for Chinatown. How did you get started here? We started since the 1980s, um, when we first came over here. Um, there wasn't too many Asian people, um, and there was it was fairly, a fairly new Chinatown. What is the one thing in Chinatown that you're most proud of? I would say the archway. I think when the Mayor Barry, um, I guess, received that um, archway from China, I think it really, Ch Chinatown really became to more lively. My parents actually own the restaurant that's across the street, Tony Chang's. Mongolian and seafood restaurant, so we've been in Chinatown for over 30 years. What is one, un one unique thing about Chinatown? Um, you know, you have the archway, and that's like an architectural symbol, but at the same time you need the people to really give, you know, the soul of, of, of the area. Are there still many Chinese people in Chinatown? There's still a few people, especially the elder um, generation uh, that lives in Wallach House. That's uh, six in age. The majority of the residential, the Asian residential population in Chinatown lives in the Wallach House. So it means a lot for Chinatown. Um, you know, it's kind of the symbol of, you know, the older generations in Chinatown and, you know, why we, why it is important for us to preserve Chinatown and why it's still important for us to care for um, the Wallach House. You know, it's my, my grandparents live there. 
there have been a lot of changes. I mean, if, I think if you were here maybe 15 years ago, um, there certainly was not the Verizon Center. Um, but with the new Verizon Center and the new Convention Center, um, we see a lot more people coming into the city to experience DC. Chinatown's become more of a destination. Are you like concerned that you know that the, that the Asian uh, population will move out and another population will move in and like establish something else here? Um, that doesn't concern me. I mean, you're seeing it already. Most of the residential population in Chinatown is not Chinese. As long as we can keep the look of Chinatown and the feel of Chinatown, um, and that's, you know, kind of what the struggle is now. How do we keep Chinatown looking like Chinatown? How do we keep it feeling like Chinatown? Well, most of the buildings you see here have to have Chinese design. The signs have to be in Chinese. So at least when people know, uh, you know, if they see a sign in Chinese, oh, they're in Chinatown. Um, so, so that's, I feel, that's the most we can do. You can't force people to move back into Chinatown who are Chinese um, unless they want to do it themselves. We can get moved around, shuffled around. Um, the Chinese people can move out, but there still will always be a Chinatown here. From a black Georgetown to a once predominantly white Anacostia, so the city students uncover the rich and varied past of Washington, D.C. Through video, painting, writing, and lively discussions, students learn that D.C. is more than the nation's capital, more than a place where deals are made and world leaders converge. It is indeed all of those things, but D.C. has for centuries been home to real people like themselves who work hard to sustain their families and their communities.